Thank you, Steve. It's interesting. You were here the first Sabbath that I was here. Um, and uh, I thought, wow, Florida. Um, I just came back from Puerto Rico. And uh, I was asked how it was. And I tell you, there's, there's a test of endurance, you know, if your character to be able to endure the the burden of wearing shorts and flip-flops. <laughs> it's this annoying thing called sweat that just sneaks up on you from the 80-some degree weather and humidity and <clears throat> awful fresh bananas and fresh fruit. It's good to be back in the Detroit area. <laughs> you know, it's you. It's the Lord, it's the church. Anywhere you go, it doesn't matter about the snow or the sleet or any other stuff. Um, it's about the Lord. And because we make it about the Lord, by default, we make it about each other. Church would not be church without each other. We're going to begin the year. Looking at something, I'm going to ask you before we have the opening prayer to have your bulletin out. I hope everybody has gotten a bulletin. Every Sabbath, <coughs> excuse me, every Sabbath, we have this in front of us. And I know that we read it sometimes. I know that Pastor Justin did a four-part series on, on our mission statement. And I would like for us to begin this year reviewing it. We cannot afford to forget this. We cannot forget, afford to ignore why we are here. This embodies our Father's business, what we prayed for during the prayer. I invite you to bow your heads with me. Ask the Lord to make our ears open and our hearts willing. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for that night of silence when you were born. Lord, it was part of your mission you never lost sight of it. And because, Father, you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit have been faithful with your mission, we stand here today receiving grace and forgiveness and restoration and healing. But the mission is not just for us to receive, but for us to be able to pass those blessings on. Speak to our hearts open our ears, grant me clarity of expression, grant all of us, including me, Father, a heart that is soft and willing. In Jesus' name, amen, Father. We're going to read out loud together the Oakwood Seventh-day Adventist Church mission statement. I hope everybody has their bulletin out. It's right smack in the middle, underneath the Great Commission, Excuse me, which inspires and directs our mission statement. I hope everybody's ready. Please follow along with me. We believe in the beauty and dignity of every person and the strength that is found in our Christ-centered community of faith. In Jesus, we welcome all men, women, and children. We pledge by our Bible study, worship, and service to share God's love freely. We honor and support the importance of every person's calling to serve God. Amen. This is quite a thought-out, well-crafted mission statement for our church. It's quite comprehensive, and this morning we're going to spend some time looking at it piece by piece, if you're not aware of this, there are four parts to this mission statement. It's interesting how it begins. I told you that um, two years ago almost, this June it will be two years, <coughs> excuse me, I became a U.S. citizen, and I got uh, some documents given as a gift. I had to study these to become a U.S. citizen, which made me appreciate even more becoming a U.S. citizen. This uh, booklet that I got from the U.S. government 
has the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. Both of these documents start, or, <coughs> excuse me, begin, you know, the Declaration of Independence when in the course of human events, make some, some statements, but the actual Declaration of Independence begins with the word, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It starts with what word? We. The Constitution, you know what word it begins with? We the people. This is the United States mission statement. The Constitution is what has made this country a country that has a long line of people waiting to come in. In spite of all the, the hiccups and things that we can point at, the mistakes and all those other things, my friends, no other country has a long line waiting for people to come in like the United States. And it's because the United States has fought tooth and nail for maintaining its mission statement. A mission statement that began with the word, we the people. Every statement of the Oakwood Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know what word it begins with? We. It is as, as if it was our Declaration of Independence, our constitution for our church. When, we, when the United States had to develop the Declaration of Independence, it was actually saying, this is the reason why we think we need to come into existence. Prior to this, this country was non-existent. But our founding fathers felt compelled and convicted there has to be a new country formed. And it's not going to be like the one we left. And to ensure of that, we forged the Constitution of the United States of America. It's a beautiful document. When I studied it, because I was going to get tested on it, I began to realize I, I, I am glad that I waited. I'm glad I did not leave that line. When I came back after the test, I was still in Bering Springs, I asked some of my born U.S. citizen friends some questions that I had to learn. And I made a discovery. <laughs> I think your laughter tells me that you might have a hint as to what that discovery is. You know what I discovered? Most Americans never read it because they never had to wait in line. And so it made sense to me why some Americans burn the flag, some Americans look for ways to not pay taxes, they revolt. And I, like I said, you know, I'm not saying the United States is perfect, there is no perfect country. But the fact is, there is no other country with a line in immigration like the United States of America. People outside still see this as a good place to be in. Maybe some of us have been born into Oakwood Church. Maybe some of us, like myself, have been born into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'll be transparent with you this morning. I shared this last night at the young adult uh, study group that we had at Amos and Candace's home. Because we are born into it, we take a lot of it for granted. Does that make sense, what I just said to you? Sometimes it takes people from the outside to come in and tell us to our face, what are you complaining about? Do you know what you have here? It's awesome! That's, what I, that's my mission now as a brand new spanking U.S. citizen. Stop your whining. I waited 26 years to be in this country. And I'm glad I did. Stop complaining. As a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, I, uh, I still a young adult Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I was reminded last night that I'm still in my 30s, so I'm still counted as a young adult. <laughs> I have six months. <coughs> this next April, not four months, this April I turned 40. My goodness. 
Then I become young for another generation, right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> As a Seventh-day Adventist pastor that has grown up in this church, God has sent, like Jonah, sailors that were pagans, atheists, that then came into our church to tell me to my face how good I've had it all my life, knowing Jesus, knowing what we know as a church, and to stop my complaining and my whining, and to get involved in the Lord's business. It's amazing how natural it is. My, my youth leader in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, he was my, my pagan sailor that the Lord sent for me. Bob Smith was um, the son of an alcoholic father who was very abusive, and so he grew up with a mom that tried to compensate. And Bob Smith grew up very violent, very angry. And he one time punched someone really hard. This is when he was married and made that person a handicapped individual. And that woke him up, that he needed something. And providentially, the Lord brought people into his life, gave him Bible studies. And when he discovered this, he had grown up Catholic, he knew about God, but he did not know, understand the fullness of the gospel. But when he came into that knowledge of the fullness of the gospel, this is what amazed me. No one had to tell Bob, not that you are a baptized member, there are things for you to do in the Lord's house. It was just natural for him to say, well, what can I do? And when Bob would spend many Friday nights, many Sabbaths, many weekdays, praying with me, listening to me, encouraging me, he modeled for me the mission statement that we're going to look at this morning. I pray that it's not just a first sermon of the year. I'm going to tell you up front, in your bulletin, you probably saw this already. Asides the, the paper that we have every Sabbath for you to take notes, if you want to, there's a paper that I'm going to close with as an appeal. I pray that as we hear this sermon, we will realize all of us, all of us should have a place in here. All of us are part of this mission. So let us begin. We've read it out loud. We believe in the beauty and dignity of every person and the strength that is found in our Christ-centered community of faith. That statement, <coughs> excuse me, is the first part. I told you there's four. And I'm, I, I've separated some of these. We have this belief. We have this conviction. The Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Oakwood in Taylor, Michigan, has this conviction. We believe in the beauty and dignity of every person. You know what that means? I'll say it to you wrong. Hopefully we'll get it by contrast. This is not saying we believe in the beauty and dignity of every Christian. Did you catch the contrast? I'll say it again wrong. We believe in the beauty and dignity of every Seventh-day Adventist. The Oakwood Seventh-day Adventist Church believes this, is fully convicted of this, that we believe in the beauty and dignity of every what? Person. That is the only way to look at humanity if we're going to be biblical. This is a highly biblical statement. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, I believe, I wasn't there when they forged the mission statement here in Oakwood, but as I thought about it and I began to look closely at the statements and the wording of it, I began to realize it makes total sense why we, as a church, would see beauty and dignity on every... We should see that. Our mission statement does not necessarily declare what we are. Our mission statement reminds us what we agree we need to be. It challenges us. It is our litmus test. It is our thermostat or thermometer, both. It lets us know if we are where we're supposed to be. And when I asked, how did you guys come up with this mission statement? It wasn't developed by one individual or two individuals. It was the work of the church. 
This is what Oakwood Seventh-day Adventist Church has agreed to make its DNA of our church. And it begins in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Then God saw that everything he had made, and indeed it was very good. When God made it, what he created, he saw that there was beauty, design, intentionality in everything he made. And in verse <coughs> excuse me, 27 of Genesis chapter 1, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Every person, every human being has beauty and dignity. Not just Christians. That confronted me. I need to be careful how I speak from the front about other faith groups or people that are, have no faith at all, atheists. In the eyes of God, they have beauty and they have dignity. No Christian, no pastor will ever be excused or justified in disrespecting another human being. Why? Because God is their creator. Whether that human being acknowledges God or not, God does. God acknowledges every single human being as his child. He gives them life. He gives them sunshine and rain and the presence of his spirit, striving against their hearts, just like he strives against ours. God is seeking for the salvation and redemption of every single human being, and we in Oakwood agree with God. Amen? Every human being has beauty and dignity and hence eternal value. Now, if we're going to treat the, outs the, the people that are not part of our faith group with that level of respect, with that level of dignity, how should we treat each other? <coughs> Excuse me. Forgive my, my cough, beloved. It's a Michigan virus that went with me to Puerto Rico, and the saline water couldn't kill it. So hopefully the white snow will do away with it. <clears throat> if I, if I, in your mind's eye, if I had a big rock, can you see the rock? It's quite heavy. It's not the kind of rock that will shatter when you hit something hard. It's the kind of rock that when you hit something, it will go through it if thrown hard enough. Rabia, if I gave you that rock and I said, you know, I want to see if you can throw and aim and hit the sound system real good, or better yet, where's one of our HD cameras? See if you, with that rock, you can just aim real good, Rabia, swing it, and bust it. Would you do it? If, you ask me. if I asked you, that's a sign. You shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Rabia, repent. If a pastor asks you to throw a rock at a camera, don't do it. Call the conference. I know, I, I appreciate that level of respect you have for me. I, I don't think Rabia would do it. I don't think any of you would. If I gave you that rock and I say, hey, see if we can put a hole in this wall right here, or a hole there. I don't think any of us would do that, right? Why be that careful with a structure that is non-living, but be so careless with the stones that come out of our mouth towards each other? What's of more value, the camera, the wall, or each other? See, this mission statement is beautiful. It prevents the abuses. It prevents the attacks. Paul called it, you should not devour one another. Because each of you have beauty and dignity. Because you were made in God's image. You are God's property. And we acknowledge that. 
Not simply by not, by not working for 24 hours a day. Sabbath is not simply about not working. Sabbath is about acknowledging we have a creator that created every single human being in this planet, including you and me. Do I see beauty and dignity in each of you? Do you see beauty and dignity in every person in this church right now? Because you see, the Lord led our church in forging this mission statement and to start there because it was there that the early church had the hardest struggle with. But when I mean by the early church, I mean the 12 disciples. <coughs> what was at the heart of the great challenge Jesus had with his 12 disciples? What was uppermost in each of the disciples' minds? Who is going to be first? Now, if I'm thinking who is going to be first, my thinking is not, you know, I think, I think Rabia should be first. I mean, he's so obedient to the pastor. He'll break a camera. <laughs> Just kidding. When the disciples were asking the question, who should be first, who did they have in mind? Themselves. Now, for me to adopt that level of logic and reason that I should be first in order to arrive at that conclusion, what other conclusion by default I must have arrived first? That you do not deserve. That you are second to me. That I am better than you. Jesus looked at them and said, you want to be first? You need to be? If I, your Lord and Master, if I, your Savior, came not to be ministered to, not to be served, but to serve, what should his professed followers believe? How should they see? Because see, Jesus would not even wound, hurt, or humiliate Judas Iscariot. The one who would betray him, Jesus treated with gentleness because he saw in Judah's beauty and dignity to the very end. That is quite a mission statement. Amen. Number two, we need to move on. I skipped some things. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Beloved, we cannot afford to skip church. Church is not optional. We need each other. We need the company, the fellowship with each other. Hebrews 12, 1, we need to surround ourselves with a cloud of witnesses. Revelation 14, 12 speaks about here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here are those, not here is he. Or here is she. Here are they. They have learned to see community and dignity and beauty in every single person. Thank you so much, Christy. Number two in the mission statement, I've, I've switched. It says, in Jesus, we welcome all men and children so that we have continuity with the word we at the beginning. I phrased it, we in Jesus welcome all men, women, and children. That word welcome is loaded. That word welcome doesn't mean we open the door and, anyone, and we let people in. That word welcome speaks about resisting, intentionally resisting, developing this attitude of exclusiveness. It's our church. I have to conf I'll be transparent with you. I am human like you. When I was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Pastor Carter was approached by a gentleman that wanted to start an Alcoholics Anonymous group in the Harrisburg First Seventh-day Adventist Church where I had my membership. And I was one of the elders. <coughs> Pastor Carter said, listen, we have this group of people that want to come into our church. What do you guys think? Only one person objected. You know who that person was? Me. You know why I objected? I said, Pastor Carter, I'm in nursing school. I've been to these AA meetings. They don't drink anymore, but they smoke like chimneys. They will make our church stink. 
with cigarette smoke. That's all it took, and he got dropped. And we lost this wonderful opportunity to minister to beautiful people, and every human being has what two qualities? Beauty and? Was I seeing brethren with, that were coming to Alcoholics Anonymous as they having beauty and dignity with that statement? No. You know, I mentioned to some of you, but it, now that we have Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm, this was done before I came here, praise the Lord, this is evidence that we are living our mission. It means that we are in, in embracing what God has impressed our church to be. Not every church has a school. Not every church is called to do these kind of things. But God has called our church to it. And by God's grace, we are stepping up to God's calling for our mission here at Oakwood. This is Oakwood's Seventh-day Adventist Church mission statement. Not Metro, not PMC, not Loma Linda. This is us. And this Christmas, beloved, because of some of you Seeing this, there were several hundred Bibles called the Serenity Bible, the New Testament. You may not be familiar with this, but it's the New Testament that has the 12 steps integrated right into them. And from the first time I found out that our brethren here were meeting, I was just burdened with putting the Word of God in their hands. They have the book, the traditions, the 12 steps, but I wanted them to have God's Word. And one, some of you, actually, it was just one of you, provided the funding so that several of those Bibles, about 50 of some of those Bibles, could be placed into their hands this past Christmas. Do only people that smell like polo sport have beauty and dignity? Do only people that have showered before Sabbath morning worship have beauty and dignity? Do I see beauty and dignity in everyone? Jesus did. And that is his calling for anyone that professes to be his follower. Amen? We need to move on. We need to move on. <coughs> we welcome in Jesus that that little phrase stumped me. What does it mean that in Jesus we welcome? We welcome in Jesus. Romans chapter 3 verse 24 says this. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Have you been redeemed by the grace of Christ? Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Jesus. To those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Are you blessed with the conviction that there is no more condemnation hanging over your head? Romans 12, 4 through 5 says, For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. What does it mean that we welcome everyone in Christ? We cannot welcome anyone unless we have experienced conversion. Unless we have tasted the grace of God that places in the dust any human pride that we may harbor, especially the spiritual pride. When we have tasted this grace that places me beyond condemnation, and brings me and unites me with one of you guys as one in Christ, as one in his body, then and only then am I empowered to welcome anyone because I have seen how God sees me. I have seen how patient and long-suffering and gentle he has been with me. I have been convicted that, Lord, how can you put up with a knucklehead like me? And when another knucklehead comes along, I look at them and say, well, if Jesus is so patient and kind and gentle with me, Lord, let that grace flow through me to them. We will not be able to welcome Jesus into our church unless we are converted. 
Let us not forget that Jesus' first sermon, when he says, I've come to set you free, they got so angry at him, they were ready to throw him off a cliff. That congregation could not see beauty or dignity, even in Jesus. And they could not even welcome Jesus. They were wanting to kill him on Sabbath. Amazing, isn't it? How our mission statement is such a power-packed challenge for our Christian life. It is not a dormant statement that we can just walk over. It demands a daily conversion of our hearts. It demands a daily awareness. I need to continue being a recipient of the grace of God in my life. I am not there yet. And looking back at God's treatment of me through my years empowers me, models for me how I should treat you. When Jesus has taken the plank out of your eye, you know what it, what it feels like, and you recognize you are no longer qualified to take even a speck out of anyone else's eyes. You become thoroughly convinced the only one that can perform eye surgery of planks or specks is Jesus Christ. You, all we are are the people that bring people to the physician. You and I are not the eye surgeon. Thank God. You should be glad I'm not your eye surgeon. I will give you not just a eyectomy. I, I <laughs> I'll probably damage other stuff in the process as well, and we've seen it. As a church, can we afford to forget our mission statement? When was the last time I looked through it? I thought about it. Meditated on it. Past, the, the Lord led Pastor Justin to do a four-part series. Have I taken ownership of what our church is being called to be? This, beloved, don't feel, comfortable, don't feel uncomfortable if it's suddenly becoming clear that we're not there yet, because we're not. Let's be honest, amen? Because the moment we think we're there, we're in big trouble. Watch out. This is a statement that will be valid, challenging until Jesus comes. This is a journey. This is something that Sabbath after Sabbath, month after month, year after year, we learn to embody this. As a pastor, I don't have it, everything figured out. Ask my wife. But she will tell you, I'm not the same Ariel she married five years ago. But it's because of God's grace. We need to move on. Three, we pledge by our Bible study, worship, and service to share God's love freely. I'm going to do this backwards so that we can, I think, grasp it more fully. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you, how do we share God's love freely through service? Because it's those three channels. We share God's love freely through our Bible study, through our worship, and through our service. So let me ask you, how do we share God's love freely through service? What does service mean? Helping others. Give me an example. What does it mean to help someone? Take care of their needs. I'm thinking of Matthew 25, 34 through 30 through 40. When the, then the king shall say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick, I was in prison, and you came to me. Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to who? To me. So, how do we share God's love freely through service? That is, I think, one of the most literal ways to express Christianity. 
providing food for the hungry. Did you know that our church has a food pantry? That once a month we open our facilities up for people that have not enough to eat? Our church may not be a perfect church, but beloved, stop complaining. Our country may not be the most perfect country in the world, but stop complaining. You would not want to be in Cuba. Bless those brethren that live there, but you don't want to be there if you're used to running water and all the other goodies that we have in this country. Oakwood, is, Oakwood Seventh-day Adventist Church is not a perfect church, but beloved, by the grace of God, we are trying to fulfill our mission. I've asked you, how do we share God's love freely through service? I'm going to ask you a harder question. It's part of our mission statement. How do we share God's love freely through worship? That's the same. I'm sorry? By the way we live. By the way we live. Amen. But I'll be honest with you. That silence, I had that silence too when I thought about that. We don't typically think about sharing God's love freely through worship, but we do. And the Lord, through his spirit, led our church to have this as part of our core values, our core beliefs, that through worship, we are called to share God's love freely. I'm gonna just give you short because of time. One passage, Luke 4, 16 says, so Jesus came to Nazareth, where he, had, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. What does it say? Stood up to criticize, to read. You know, <clears throat> that is a wonderful little model of church. It was his custom not just to go to church on Sabbath. That is not a good custom. It is a good custom to go to church on Sabbath and participate. Amen? So how do we show, share God's love freely through worship? I think we do it most practically within our circle. When we do not let one person carry five hats and I carry none. It, it should bother me that we have so many needs and so much potential and Beloved, this year is going to be an exciting year for us here at Oakwood. Not just, I'm not just telling you this. We have a huge evangelistic series taking place this September. Not just us. Every church in the southeastern part of Michigan, of, of Michigan, all of us at the same time are having an evangelistic series in September. There's a lot of preparation that's, that's going to need to take place for them, by then. Do you believe that as a church, we are the visible body of Christ here on earth? Are you part of that body? You know, you're sitting down right now, but every part of your body is doing something right now. If there's a part of my body that is not doing anything, it's because it's dead. These were the things that Robert Smith, Bob Smith, my youth leader, confronted me with. I was a church member, but I was not a body member. Does that make sense to you? I was a church member because it was my custom to come to church every Sabbath, but I just sat. You know, you think, well, pastor, technically speaking, the keratin in your nail is dead. Let me see you say that when you have an itch. Even the nail does something. Every part of our body functions, works. Do you think that only some members of the church should be doing something in the church? Or do we believe that every member of the church should be doing something in the church? Option A or option B? Beloved, this is our mission statement. Let me tell you something that leaves my, me scratching my head. 
there are individuals that are intentionally undermining the Constitution of the United States. And it does hurt our country when that happens. That's our mission statement. By me choosing to be a church member, but not a body of Christ member, I am undermining our church's mission statement. And a church that ignores its mission that God has commissioned to it, Jesus said it, a house divided cannot stand. He who does not gather with me scatters. Are you a church member only? Or am I willingly, intentionally wanting to be part of the living, organic, growing, thriving, working body of Christ? See, Bob did not, all he did is minister to me. And when I saw this 50 plus year old man who had just been a Christian a few years, a Seventh-day Adventist for a few years, be elder, then become head elder and bring people to Christ in just four or five years. And I had been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian for over 27 years and I hadn't shared Jesus with one person. I did not take ownership of the church. I had to be begged to do things for the church, plead it like if I was something special. I was not converted. I had not tasted the grace of God. But I have. It changes everything when you experience the conversion of God. This no longer becomes a, oh, so much stuff. Who thought of this? I want to talk to that person. This becomes a joy. This is exciting. This makes church worth coming. I want to be a part of this. Sign me up. When Christ is in the heart, when the grace of God has been experienced, come on, that is such an energizing, empowering source of energy for the Christian. The love of Christ constrains us to see dignity and beauty, to want to be part of an organic body, a body that grows, a body that works. We need to conclude. We finish with a pretty strong statement. Excuse me. <coughs> we honor and support the importance of every person's calling to serve God. Romans 10, 13 through 15 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul asked the question, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And this is not talking about pastors. Do you believe that? Who is this speaking about? Every single one of us. We honor and support the importance of every person's calling to serve. It is not just a welcome and sit. It is a, a welcome, let's get to work. We need hands, we need minds, we need feet, we need energy, we need ideas, and not just a few, we need everyone, everyone, beloved, everyone. You will not cut off your pinky, you cannot play baseball without it, you could not cut off your toe, you cannot walk with it. There is not one body part that you could do without. 
and the church cannot do without you. Our head elder kept using this, this word, your providence, through your providence, through your providence. Why am I, why, how did I end up in Taylor, Michigan? How does a Puerto Rican, how does a Dominican from the beautiful Caribbean end up in Taylor, Michigan? How does someone from Belize end up in Michigan? How does someone from India, how does someone from, with the background of Poland or Iran or Argentina end up in Taylor, Michigan at this moment, at this time, if it was not for the providence of God directing all of us? We are not here by accident. We are not here because of a job. We are not here because of school. We are here because God has called you and me for service at this time. You and I need this mission. You and I need to embrace it, own it, and make it part of us. We cannot afford. We will stop being church without a mission. When we said about welcoming, we are not welcoming people into a club. We're not welcoming people into cliques. We're not welcoming people into all those other things that are secular. When Paul thought about what to compare the, the, the church of Christ, he compared it to a body where there is no hierarchy, where there's a need, a recognized need for every part. Every part is individual, but every part is recognized to be part of the whole. And the value of the individual parts are found and exercised only when they are part of the complete of the whole. I told you at the beginning of the sermon that I have a, an a, appeal for you. Please, if you could be so kind, if you could please take out this white piece of paper. We make resolutions, but this is not a resolution. This is a response to God's calling. Resolutions are things we think we need to do in our lives. The mission is what God has asking us to do right now. This is different than a resolution. I agree. I agree with and personally accept God, Oakwood's mission statement. I pledge by God's grace to uphold it completely. I need to sign this, not because I am your pastor, but because as I look at each phase of my life, God has been preparing me to be here at this time. I need to accept this mission, and I do. I also know that God did not just direct an Argentinian married to a Puerto Rican that they met in Ohio to come and serve in Michigan. It's also you, my friend. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one who has guided Oakwood through its many years, and the one who has inspired the leadership to develop that mission statement, I plead with you. I ask you if you will accept this mission statement as yours. If you will, sign and keep it. Tear that top part, place it in your Bible, place it where you're reading for your morning devotions, and keep a bulletin handy. We will forget easily our mission. So there's three questions in this piece of paper. Keep the top part. This is for you, to remind you and me of what we are committing to this year. I want Oakwood's mission statement as mine. But there's three questions. 
I want to join Oakwood Seventh-day Adventist Church family, join the body of Christ, as Corinthians told us, by baptism, either through membership transfer or baptism preparation. Circle either one of those. God wants to use you here. You need to be part of this body. To be part of the mission, you need to be part of the body. The second question says, I want to identify my spiritual gifts, and I skipped through some of those because of time restraints. I want to identify my spiritual gifts. I am interested in joining the spiritual gift assessment program that is scheduled to take at the end of January. Actually, Pastor Veras and I have been brainstorming about this, when to do it, and how for some time now. And this morning, he handed me this flyer. It will actually start Sabbath, January 26, from 9 to 10. This is if you want to serve, but you're not quite sure where, how. You have the desire, but you would like to be able to say, I feel God, I know for, it took me years to discover God has given me a strong gift in teaching. I'm passionate about explaining things and helping people understand things. So, but it took me some of these workshops to help me identify that strength that God has placed in me, this gift, this spiritual gift. If you're not quite sure, at the end of this month, we will begin this spiritual journey of discovery. What has God gifted you to be in this church? And the last one, the last one that I hope every one of us sees the need to accept. I want to exercise God's call to serve him through my spiritual gifts. I am making myself available to be contacted regarding Oakwood ministry opportunities. And if you would put there, if it's music, if it's teaching, if it's, I mean, we have people here that do HVAC. And that's, those are talents and, and things that are valuable for our church. Carpentry, painting, electricity, computer, video, genetics. We have a geneticist up in the balcony. Anything and everything that you are good at, God has brought you in this, to, this, to this church body to use those skills for him, for the mission. I am making myself available to be contacted regarding Oakwood ministry opportunities. And then please fill out the contact information. I'm going to have a closing prayer and then we'll sing the closing song. But keep this available because I'm, I've asked the deacons and the elders to stand at the doors with... Um, I don't know if they'll have plates or they'll just take it from you. Give it to them. <laughs> with, all, with all the conviction, beloved, that I can muster, I really plead with you, you will not leave this church service without having made this decision. I prayed, many people have prayed, I have wrestled with the Lord, I don't want this to be a sermon. I want this to be an embracing of what Oakwood is called to be. This sermon is entitled, This is Oakwood. This is Oakwood. You and I are looking at what Oakwood is. Oakwood is what you and I do here to fulfill this mission. Father, I am glad that you stress about how imperfect and all these other things that get in the way of you speaking to each of us. Everyone here has gifts. That is a given, Lord. When we give our lives to you, when we experience conversion, we not just get salvation and grace. We don't just get forgiveness and cleansing. Your word tells us that the Holy Spirit gives to each of us spiritual gifts. Sorry, Lord, that for many years I kept mine dormant, kept mine unused. I'm glad, Lord, that you were patient and gentle with me, as you are with all of us. But, Father, we don't want to keep things dormant. Your spirit has spoken clearly to all of us this morning. We want to be part of your living body. 
a body that does, a body that grows. We want to experience your grace afresh, Lord, that we will treat each other with the kindness and gentleness modeled by Jesus, that we will see beauty and dignity in every human being, that we will welcome everyone in Jesus. We can welcome even you, Lord, without having our heart transformed. I pray for this church which you have asked me to lead. I pray, Father, for what you have placed in my heart. I pray that all of us, all of us, will be willing and choose to put our hand to the plow, to get busy with your business. In Jesus' name, amen, Lord.